Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Real History. I'm your host, history professor Jared Frederick, and in this installment, we are going to be analyzing the history as depicted in Episode 6 of Apple TV's Masters of the Air. Once again, the 100th Bomb Group went through a rather precarious situation in our previous episode. John Egan has to bail from his plane, and he now finds himself in Germany, and I suspect that a substantial portion of this episode will look to see what happens to him next. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next episode of Masters of the Air. For you, the war's over. I've read in various newspaper accounts from the war years that, that these words were often the first heard by American prisoners, whether they were captured at Kasserine Pass or shot down over Germany. And indeed, these were not words that you would wish to hear. Um, and uh, according to Donald Miller's book, Masters of the Air, which I have right here, nice autograph copy, uh, no less, uh, Egan spent several days on the run in Germany after October 10th, 1943, the mission that he was shot down. And he was captured, apprehended several days later. And in preparing for this episode, I discovered that uh, notice of his capture was actually reported by the Associated Press on November 15th. And it was that same week that his widowed mother, Frances, back in Wisconsin, was notified of his capture. And on the point of sidearms, um, carrying these on missions could be a rather dicey proposition and add a lot to the already many uh, mental strains uh, going hand in hand with all of this. And my friend, John Homan, uh, who I helped to author his memoir, Into the Cold Blue, which you can find information of down below. Uh, he had this to say on the matter of carrying sidearms and also the potentiality of capture. He said, I could not mentally prepare myself for the possibility of capture. We were provided little instruction on how to interact with would-be captors. Naturally, we were informed to provide nothing more than our names, ranks, and serial numbers if apprehended. Additionally, we were ordered to escape by any means necessary if an opportunity presented itself. While many airmen sported sidearms during missions, I purposefully left mine in my footlocker. If I was shot down and the Germans were hunting me, I might have been tempted to use the weapon. Such an act surely would have been a death sentence for me. I therefore removed my pistol from the equation. Bubbles' death hit me pretty hard, and Colonel Harding thought it would be good for me to represent the 100th at a conference between the Allied nations. On heading to Oxford, Crosby had this to say about how that decision came about. In October, when we got shot up over Bremen, our crew was scheduled to go to a flak shack our gunners went, but when Blake became squadron commander of the 418th and Doug and I moved up to headquarters, we were too busy with our new jobs to leave the base. When I got my feet more or less under me, I applied again for R&R. &R. Instead, the group adjutant, Major Carl Standish, came into my office. The Allied Command has scheduled a high-level conference to see what can be done about the problems we are having with fraternization on the one hand and squabbling among the Allies on the other. I think you might find it interesting. It's at Oxford University, Standish said. For two weeks, beginning in February uh, 21st, 1944, I studied and conferred at Oxford University, one of the high points intellectually of my life. And then, too, there is the truth behind the actual death of Crosby's friend Joseph Bubbles Payne, who actually died on April 28th, 1944, and not October 1943, as depicted here. And in looking up wartime articles on Bubbles, I found this interesting item from June 4th, 1944, published two days before D-Day. 
Captain Joseph H. Payne, Jr., holder of the Air Medal and the Distinguished Flying Cross for gallantry in action during numerous air raids against Germany, has been missing in action over France since April 28th, according to word received by his parents. And this is from the Lexington Herald Leader, by the way, in Kentucky where his parents resided. And this is where it really gets interesting. The young flyer, a navigator, received public notice earlier in the war when he flew missions in the area of Koblenz, Germany, where he was born 23 years ago. I don't know if it's actually ever uh, stated that he was actually born in Germany in the series. His father was a member of the Army of Occupation in the First World War, and his mother was an Army nurse. So. What an interesting backstory behind dear old Bubbles Payne. But it was not until November 5th, several months thereafter, until his parents, Joseph and Gertrude, uh, learned about their son's fate. And today you can find Payne's grave in the Normandy American Cemetery. It arrived for you two days ago. I hope it's nothing urgent. My wife, <laughs> she, uh... I couldn't stand the idea of a week going by without sending a letter. How thoughtful. Crosby's family spent considerable time writing to him, and he often reciprocated the favor as often as he could. And uh, the following appeared in the Des Moines Tribune on October 11th, 1943. And so that's just a day after this horrific mission to Munster that the 100th flew. And... Uh, this is a nice little excerpt of what Crosby had written about some of his recent deeds. We've completed 14 missions and have flown over 19 countries, including Germany, where they don't like us at all, France, Iceland, Labrador, England, Scotland, Ireland, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Belgium, Italy, Corsica, Sardinia, Africa, and others. That is what First Lieutenant Harry Crosby, formerly of Des Moines, wrote to his grandparents recently. Now, it's always nice to offer a little bit of home front perspective as we find out who these guys are and what they're writing home. Munster was only Rosie's third mission, but it was so horrific that Colonel Harding ordered Lieutenant Rosenthal and his crew to spend a week of R&R &R at a place we called the Flack House. John Homan likewise has memories of these so-called Flack Houses. And uh, this uh, is his recollection on the matter. A flight surgeon kept a close eye on us. And then he's reflecting on how and why you might be chosen to go to a flack house. If we were twitching, blinking, or ticking too much, we might be candidates for some R&R. &R. I suppose our recent exploits rendered us more than eligible. Also known as flack farms, the rest facilities were usually located at secluded hotels, clubs, estates, and coastal areas to afford battle-fatigued flyboys relaxation. Army psychologists were often on hand to assess shell-shocked service members. We enjoyed a quality menu, no discipline, and no uniform codes. The environment was designed to be a complete divorce from combat and military life. The boys savored the interlude. And as to the Coombs house, this was a Victorian era manor near Shaftesbury that had been a hotel for many years. And then uh, it was converted into this rest home for 8th Air Force Airmen. And then after the war, it became a, uh, a sc school for Catholic girls. And uh, it served in that capacity for many decades thereafter. As I mentioned in a previous episode, I was hopeful that scenes like this would be shown because I think it's important to reflect upon the fact that Allied airmen killed nearly 600,000 Germans through these air raids 
um, two-thirds of which were estimated to be civilians. And the irony here is that the scene shown in this moment is essentially the same one that Egan witnessed in London, and that is a mother crying out for her dead child. What's in the los? Warum sind die denn hier? Amerikaner! Tauflieger! Amerikanischer Feiglinger! Joseph Goebbels, uh, Hitler's chief propagandist, at one point claimed that he could no longer guarantee the safety of captured airmen if unrelenting campaigns against German cities persisted. And uh, these, these verbal tirades on the part of German propaganda generally evoked little concern among Allied flyers at least until they themselves were captured. And then they realized, oh, there might be a little bit of truth to this sort of vitriol being expressed. I don't know all the particulars of Egan's journey. Uh, maybe they're to be found in a post-war captivity report or something like that. But what we are seeing here is a slightly fictionalized version of an event that actually took place in Rüsselsheim, Germany on August 26, 1944. Uh, American POWs were being transported through that community, but their trip was halted when the railroad lines going through it, when they realized that they had been destroyed by Allied bombs. And Therefore, the prisoners were marched through the town, like we see here, and the anger of the townspeople could not be contained. And ultimately, six Americans were killed by the civilians in the exact manner as we see here. Egan wasn't there, but this sort of retribution did in fact occur. It took you Yanks more than 500 years for your founding fathers to produce a similar bit of paper. Now, maybe if we went under the tyranny of your king for 500 years, we could have popped it out sooner. Uh, now is a good time for a little bit of artifact show and tell. Uh, I have here an original copy of a serviceman's guidebook which is entitled A Short Guide to Great Britain, published for both the Army and the Navy. And I think this uh, British gent would be well to adhere to some of the advice in the opening pages of this book. This was the advice handed down to American service members on uh, these point of cultural touchstones. No time to fight old wars. If you come from an Irish American family, you may think of the English as persecutors of the Irish, or you may think of them as enemy redcoats who fought against us in the American Revolution and the War of 1812. But there is no time today to fight old wars over again or bring up old grievances. We don't worry about which side our grandfathers fought on in the Civil War because it doesn't mean anything now. <laughs> well, I would tend to disagree, but in any case, a little bit of unanimity could perhaps be better demonstrated here by some of our allies in these scenes. <laughs> So Crosby actually did do this, and he talks about it in his memoir, A Wing and a Prayer, uh, standing in front of a mirror. He said, start naked and uh, trying on his new crusher cap. And in that moment, uh, he told himself, Crosby, you are a rock. <laughs> and so what sublime self-confidence uh, this guy has at this stage of his life. It's nice to have a little fire. So that's a Spencer Tracy line from the 1938 Aviator film entitled Test Pilot. Uh, so a very cavalier sort of action hero movie of the, the pre-war era. So a very nice little touch here. A tip of the hat to popular culture of the time. Captain Crosby, I Oh my God. Oh, don't worry, I've seen men in much less, Captain. Big family, small house, few doors. 
But you're... Subaltern Westgate, your roommate. So now we are introduced to Subaltern Wingate, as uh, Crosby was told to uh, properly pronounce. And this is what he had to say about this first encounter regarding a friendship that was going to be very meaningful to him. We talked for a while. She had signed her name A.M. Wingate because, she said, we are encouraged by the ATS to conceal our feminine names. That's why the bursar put her in with an American officer. I suspect we can maintain a decent existence. Your wife has nothing to fear from me. We can take turns with the WC, the water closet, and both have a bath. We have our separate bedrooms. Her first name was Alexandra, which she had shortened to Landra. She was a Scot, a graduate of Lady Margaret's at the University of Edinburgh. She was attractive in a clear-eyed, straight-on sort of way, average height, brown short hair, nice figure, pretty legs, even in the cotton stockings. Now, Crosby had been tempted by an old flame named Dot, who was actually in the American Red Cross in England during the war, but he ultimately couldn't convince himself uh, to cheat on his wife, Jean. And so now the big question here is, as the plot progresses, well, will his moral resolve remain strong in the wake of this blossoming friendship with Wingate? We shall see. Uh, I'll also add that when I attended the, the Masters of the Air premiere in New York City, actor Anthony Boyle, who plays Crosby, said that Belle Pally's performance as Wingate was going to be one of the really surprising delights of the show, and I have no doubt of his sincerity on that front. Perhaps if you simply taught your chaps a little moral discipline, they wouldn't always act as if they're away from home for the first time. Living it up. And with respect, sir. Each day could be their last chance to live it up. So I won't be giving them a lecture before they go on their weekend pass. A lot of this really gets to the heart of the matter. And I've mentioned this in previous episodes uh, that you had to live life quickly because life used you up quickly here during the war years. Uh, and so a little wonder that there was such energy among American airmen and service members as they were partying and traveling around England. And these sorts of tense exchanges uh, did in fact occur, and Crosby writes of many of them. Uh, and as we see in this scene where uh, Wingate steps up on his behalf, he does say in his book, the staunchest defenders of the Americans were the women members of the British forces. And so that's very accurately portrayed here. You play? No, can't play a note. Mother and sister got all the musical talent. I know it sounds good. As previously mentioned, Rosenthal was quite the connoisseur of music. This is a, a very cultured guy who comes from this very diverse and sort of cosmopolitan environment in, uh, in New York. And as a, as a fun side bit here, uh, the song that he chooses to play in this moment is a Duke Ellington tune by the name of I Let a Song Go Out of My Heart. So another one to put on your playlist associated with this series. This war, human beings weren't meant to behave this way. Fun bit of trivia here, uh, aficionados of war films might recognize actor Jamie Parker uh, in this scene, uh, who also has roles in Valkyrie and 1917. So there's a lot of convincing American accents on the part of the British actors in this series. I am your interrogator, Lieutenant Hausmann. Please sit. The actor with this very Himmler sort of look is Lewis Hoffman, who is in a really great World War II aftermath movie entitled Land of Mine, which I definitely encourage you to check out. Uh, but the guy that he is portraying here, Ulrich Hausmann, was in fact a real guy who was a Luftwaffe officer at this particular interrogation camp. And uh, this aviator was a, a son of privilege. Uh, he went to the United States for a time. He even studied at Columbia University. And I believe it's there that he was able to uh, perfect his English speaking skills. 
Um, but this guy has a really fascinating story that I that I won't spoil yet, and I'll be interested to see if the series portrays the sort of intrigue that he will become involved in. As to this interrogation camp, Du Aug Luft, uh, Masters of the Air author Donald Miller has uh, this to say. The Luftwaffe interrogators at Du Aug Luft were deeply skilled specialists who preferred methods more subtle than the rubber hose, perhaps like the Gestapo used. All of them spoke fluent English, and some had spent time in England or America. One of them was a former piano salesman from Yonkers, New York, who had returned to the fatherland after Hitler took power. The Luftwaffe resisted Gestapo and SS pressure. After the war, Hans Scharf, the famous master interrogator at Oberursel, claimed that he and his colleagues were, quote, horrified when our German radio stations broadcast a statement issued by Goebbels that all Allied airmen falling into German hands in the future were to be declared fair game in the eyes of the populace. We stood fast. Our orders remained the same as before. We were to fully protect the prisoners. So what's inferred here, and a number of World War II airmen who were captured have told me the same thing, that uh, of course there are different POW camps, or different styles of POW camps. There are those for kind of your typical line infantry, and then there's those who belong to the Allied Air Forces. And to an extent, in a lot of these Stalag Luft camps run by the Luftwaffe, there was sometimes a degree of chivalry between airmen, or at least an acknowledgement, a mutual understanding between uh, the two sides. And so I think we get a little bit of a, a sense of that in some of these scenes. As far as what you're going to get from me, it's going to be name, rank, and, and serial number. Yours is 0399510. I also know you were born in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. This sort of interaction rings very true in my mind. For instance, uh, here is what Lieutenant William Koch of the 301st Bomb Group uh, recalled of his first meeting with Hausman. And uh, what happens in this conversation is Hausman's going through this laundry list of details that he has been able to uncover about Coke and this sort of shocking moment of realization uh, that Coke thereafter has. And so he, he quotes Hausman here in retrospect, and uh, it says, you can see we know a lot about you thanks to our spies who have lived in the USA since shortly after World War I. Mm. With that, he offered me a chair and asked if I would like a cigarette, which I certainly did. He was soft-spoken and had a friendly smile, and I was surprised he didn't ask me any questions about the military. Rather, he went on to tell me what I flew in, where I was stationed, and how long I had been flying out of Foggia, uh, the base in Italy that he was at. With that, he excused me, and I was escorted back to my cell. That was a, a slight icebreaker here that they have in their first meeting. But this story also reminds me of a story shared by a dear late friend of mine by the name of Jerry Conlon, who was a bombardier in the 460th Bomb Group. He was captured and he was taken to an interrogation center, perhaps something like we see here. And uh, much like Egan in this scenario, he was only giving his name and his rank and his serial number. And the German interrogator said, it doesn't matter what you tell me because I already know everything there is to know about you. And in that moment, in very dramatic flair, he throws a dossier down on the table in front of Jerry. And Jerry opens it up and he immediately goes white in the face because within that folder are copies of his high school report card. So, Somehow, uh, somebody back in his hometown of Altoona, Pennsylvania, 
uh, was able to get copies of his report card from Altoona Catholic High School. Uh, and so uh, that town, as a side note, uh, was the subject of uh, an FBI search in the wake of Operation Pastorius as the federal government was seeking out German spies in this large railroad city. Uh, so there, there were, in fact, German operatives uh, that were hanging up their hat here stateside. Donald Miller has some additional insight to share on these flag homes, and he notes most of the flag farms were manor houses donated by their owners to the RAF, who in turn leased them to the 8th Air Force. By the end of the war, there were 15 of them, and uh, possibly even more. There's a whole book written on flag farms. Air Force medical officers visited rest houses regularly, but responsibility for running them was gradually turned over to the women of the American Red Cross, hence why we have American women and not British women who are seen to a lot of the needs and cares of men here. The aim was to make them as unmilitary as possible. At first, separate facilities were established for officers and sergeants. Later, entire crews were sometimes sent to the same place, and recognition of rank was discouraged. Lounging around the grounds in baggy sweaters, slacks, and sneakers, off-duty airmen could easily have been mistaken for sportsmen on holiday. Oh, oh wow. Oh, I have, I have chills. Um, wow. That's, that's, that's a really powerful scene. Um, and really cinematically well done too um the the chug of the locomotive almost like in in slow motion it, it sounds like like a heartbeat and it's it's very foreboding uh and there's there's a lot in this episode that is incredibly suspenseful intense and kind of this this chase and this story of survival it's it's just as intense as a lot of the air missions uh, portrayed in a lot of the previous episodes but whew, wow that was that was something wow this this rendition of Woody Guthrie's song tear the fascist down is is so powerful in how it's it's juxtaposed with all these vignettes and all these overlapping stories, which I think are very effectively meshed together. Um, this, is, this is really potent stuff. And here we are at last reintroduced to Bucky Clevin after him disappearing for the better part of a full episode. So. Butch and Sundance are back together again, as we see here. The interesting thing is that the two Buckies were actually at the Dalog Luft at the same time, and they were only a few cells apart from one another, but they didn't realize it until long after the fact. And they're there at the same time with another well-known member of the 100th Bomb Group, uh, Frank Murphy, who likewise wrote his own memoir uh, about his experiences. Uh, and then, uh, as we see here, they are ultimately reunited with the words, what the hell took you <laughs> so long? And so this story was practically tailor-made uh, to be produced into a movie at some point. This was an incredible episode, despite the fact that there were practically no aerial combat scenes in it uh, whatsoever. And as I said just a moment ago, um, despite that sort of combat depiction lacking in this episode, uh, I felt I, my heart was pounding more in this one than uh, some of the previous ones. Uh, so it's uh, incredibly suspenseful and rightfully so. And the other thing that I think was done very well in this segment in particular was the effective use of period music to advance the storyline. We have Duke Ellington, we have Artie Shaw's The Chant being reintroduced here. Uh, we have uh, Guthrie uh, right at the end. Uh, I really, really like that because it 
helps to put us in the mindset of the characters. What music was going through their minds? How were they using it to process their experiences? And so that was a particularly notable element that I enjoyed in this episode of Masters of the Air. That wraps up everything for this time. Thank you so much for joining us. If you haven't done so already, please make sure that you hit that subscribe button below. And I also welcome you to visit the website of the 100th Bomb Group Foundation, as well as to check out some of the details on my latest book that I co-authored with World War II pilot John Homan, entitled Into the Cold Blue. Uh, that His story really resonates with me as I watch uh, this series, and I think you will enjoy it too. So thank you once again for joining us, and until we see you next time on Real History, stay curious. <laughs>